Hello, and today's session is coming from Seoul in South Korea, just a few kilometers south from where the mad mass murdering dictator is polishing his nuclear weapons. And we will talk today about a topic that is probably quite central to anyone who leads, who manages, who wants to make things happen, and that is to propose something new or different. If you continue to do what you always have done, then you aren't a great leader, are you? Because the world around you is developing, and if you stand still, you most likely will go the way of the Kodaks, the Nokias, and the Blackberries. So we have an obligation as managers, as leaders, to move things forward. But very similar to you not getting the six lotto numbers right on a lotto ticket, which doesn't seem that complicated, does it? We can't really predict the future. So many people think we better not do anything new. We better not change anything until things are certain, until we know for sure that there is a certain project we should do, and then we do it. Well, if you wait until everybody else tells you what to do, that means many people have already done it, have already failed, have already improved, and therefore you come late to the party. And that means you're probably not going to win. So we need a system, we need a plan, in order to move from an idea to a reality and do this in an organized way. And we call that business planning. We plan to achieve something in the future, and since we don't quite know what the future brings, we use a fairly significant system of analyses, of fact-finding, of talking to people in order to try to get it right. So when you want to propose something new at work in order to show that you have change talent, that you can be a leader into the future, that you can be valuable to the firm, there are a couple of things you want to get right. And those are the ones we'll talk about today. Let's talk for a moment about <clears throat> what would happen if you had a project like the one that you see on the screen right now. A new set of sensors that could be attached to your body somewhere. You could wear this under your shirt. You could have it behind your ear. You could have it on your wrist. And that sensor constantly sends medical data to your smartphone. And from your smartphone through an app, it sends that data anywhere else. To the doctor, to the hospital, to a database, to anyone in Pakistan who has a system to connect and to compare and to tell early that something in your body is not right. Imagine what that would do as a social, as a medical, as a commercial activity that you would be able to predict before something bad happens to someone medically that it might happen and then you could take the appropriate action. This could be a fantastic product. It could also be a spectacular failure. So think for a moment as an example on this product, what you would have to do to propose to a group of friends, to propose to investors, to propose to your boss that this is a project to get involved in. So the first thing that we do when we have a business idea a project that we're planning for, something that we want to do, is that we make a plan. You never act without a plan. We don't do impulsive things in business. We shouldn't do it on the sports field. And we certainly do it often personally, but in hindsight, maybe shouldn't. So when we plan something, that means we have an organized pathway from where we currently are to where we want to go. Now, this is not a mathematical formula where if we string three numbers together, we're guaranteed to get the fourth number. This is subject to the influences, the whims, the disturbances of the market around us. So the first part that we need to realize is that a business plan is something that forces us to put 
ideas into writing. That's incredibly complicated. You have a fantasy. You have an idea. You have something that molds around in your head, something that you think is great. But now you have to put it on paper. Cold words, numbers, tables, facts. So the first part that a planning process does, it distills the emotion, it distills the excitement, it takes some of the fantasies and it reduces that down to something that we can identify as factors of success. It is first and foremost a sales document. It is intended to rope in others, those with money, those with power, those with influence, those with special knowledge, those that we need to be successful. In business, you are never successful on your own. You show me a successful business person, and I show you a person who has an incredibly large network, who has made friends, who gets information from many different angles, and therefore is able to succeed. Success is a team sport. That means that we need to get the team to get excited. We need others to be with us in order to make things happen. That means we need to be able to get stakeholders together. We need to be able to get people together who are supportive, who can be important, and who ultimately give us the chance to be successful. So when we look what a business plan then really includes, it is time. Nothing goes quick when you want to collect facts, when you analyze them, when you're able and willing to then go through and say, this is really not a good idea, maybe this is a good idea, and you start to begin quite critical about yourself. You begin to become concerned that maybe the idea wasn't right. You tweak the idea in order to come up with something better. All of that takes time. We need mentors, people who help us for free, usually out of goodwill because they know us, people who we've met who care about you, who want to be a sounding board, we will need some advisors, paid people who have a professional ability, a knowledge that you might not have that then allows us to proceed. We need to make sure that we have good quality data. We make no decisions unless they're based on fact. The rumblings of your tummy the mad thoughts you have at night in a dream are not fact. Market feedback, competitor analysis, facts from the outside, facts that we can gather ourselves through our R&D process, those are relevant and we only base what we do on those facts. So we need to have a process to gather data. And then we talked before about the fact that a business plan is also a sales document, we need to make sure that we have it in the right format, the right presentation for it to sell. That means it looks perfect. Whether it's PowerPoint or Prezi or printed or etched on steel plates or carried by a balloon or dragged as a big banner behind a plane over a sports field, we really need to be perfect. That means that the wording has to be massaged, wordsmithed to be perfect. The appeal has to be there. The facts have to stand out. It has to grip you as a reader. It has to make you excited. It has to give you something that you say, I want to be part of that. Now we have a number of different pathways to get to a new idea. It could be that it is a new product or a new service. That means it is something that is invented new. Clearly our example of having a sensor that takes medical data and connects that to a smartphone is new as a sensor, some piece of hardware, some software that's written. But a lot of things in new products are not new. The transmission to an app, the app itself, the way the app is operated, the fact that you have a smartphone involved, the fact that you're connecting to a server, the fact that you process data, all of those things already exist. I like newness when it is not so new 
that no one understands what you're trying to do. Newness that is an expansion, an extension of what you currently do is great newness. But something brand new that no one has ever seen before requires a lot of convincing. Imagine that in your apartment, when you walk out of your apartment door in the morning on the way to studies or work, you would have a piece of equipment built into the door frame. And as you walk through, through magnetic and miraculous waves, it would clean and press your clothes. No more dry cleaning, no more washing, no more looking wrinkled on the way to work. You walk through the door, it goes silently, and suddenly as you walk out one more step, your clothes are clean, they're pressed, they're wrinkle-free, they're good for business. That sounds pretty nifty, doesn't it? Saves money, probably. Could be built into every door frame. Could be in a big apartment block by the thousands. But would you like to be the first one to walk through? Would you like to be the one who tests that and makes sure that this really works? It will take a long time to convince people that whatever it's making the clothes clean does not hurt your liver. It does not affect your heart. It does not make your brain go weird. It doesn't make you grow hair behind your ears. It is not something that does something to you. So when we have something that is brand new and we need to explain that, we have an additional hurdle that we need to make people understand that that new product is actually doable. That hurdle is hard. It's expensive. It takes time. So when you do something new, in many cases, you expand what you have already done. You add another feature. That could be a new approach to how we deliver product, how we market product, how we ultimately engage with our customers. For 15, 20 years, Adobe, the company that makes Illustrator, PowerPoint, and all the things that you would have heard in a PowerPoint, uh, Illustrator, um, Photoshop, Dreamweaver, and so forth, a company that has sold licenses. You bought a product, you got it initially in a box, then it came by download, then it came by serial number, but you essentially bought it, you had it, you owned it, and you would renew it from time to time and pay more, but you had paid a sizable amount up front in order to use that software. And anybody who uses Photoshop uses Adobe. Adobe about four years ago switched so that they no longer sell product. All of the Adobe product for everyone is only available for rent. You no longer buy anything that you own, a license to use. You rent month by month with a small monthly payment, a product, and you rent endlessly. You would probably think that's not really a big change, is it? But it is a big change for customers because customers no longer own anything and they essentially die the death of a thousand wounds by having to pay for years and years and years, $45 a month forever. It also means that you now have constantly access to the newest software. There's no more updates. Whatever you get is the newest that they have just invented. But it means from a cash flow standpoint that you come down from $5 billion worth of annual billing to $100 million for the first year, then $300, then $800 million, and then slowly you overcome that cash flow problem because you're no longer having big income up front from the sale of a license. You have endlessly a very small amount. So you can see that on long distance, this is quite successful for the firm. It's a good change. It is a clever change. But it is something that ultimately requires that you get people on board, the CFO, the shareholders, because for quite a while you will make less money, but you will make it up in the long run. A change of delivery, a change of how that product is sold. Are there new markets? Is there either a geographic new market or a new group in your current market that your changed product, your service will appeal to? You do something with Spotify. It will appeal to a certain group of people. If you can, like Uber did, combine the Uber rental with automatically your Spotify playlist being available in that car while you drive, then maybe that gives that Uber service a better competitiveness than if you didn't do that. So you combine, you add on, you use existing services for different groups of people. 
And the most important part is that we have to have something in your plane, something in your product or service that is innovative, that is new. You need to be able to distinguish yourself from what you are doing before, what you have been doing, what others are doing now. You have to show that there is a distinction, something new. When Apple came out with the iPhone, the world did not need another smartphone. We already had smartphones everywhere. Apple didn't really do a new phone. Right? Inside is what a phone is. It dials, it ticks, it receives data, it displays. But what Apple did is that they created the App Store. They created the combination, the integration of the movies, the books, the apps in one device. That made that one device much more potent, much more successful, and that in itself was a huge innovation. Those of you that are a little older, you will remember the iPod, the initial product about 15 years ago that made Apple come out of the obscure market niche of being a computer provider for graphic designers and weird people, but to now become a mainstream product provider, and it was an MP3 player. Nothing creative about that. We had thousands of mp3 players out we have hundreds of different designs and most of them were more powerful had more buttons and switches and storage than the apple ipod but the ipod had the spinning wheel where with your thumb in your pocket you could operate that unit and you could essentially be in control without having to flip switches that sold the ipod nothing big nothing dramatic but it was a change so what we do need is we need something that provides value through uniqueness. Being special, being unique is important. That means that we need to differentiate us. We need to be different from what other people do. And it has to become quite clear to others where we are different. And the value that we provide, the difference, the uniqueness, has to deliver something sustainable no one invests no boss will support you with a new project when it only lasts a month a week a couple of years we want things that last that can be added onto that can be changed we want a son of sam we want a next generation that flows from what we do in order to have a sustainable success so uniqueness can mean that it is something brand new. And that, of course, has the risk that you need to sell people on something brand new. It can be something proven that is delivered differently, that is priced differently, that has different user facts and interfaces, and that allows people to make use of that product differently. It could be an improvement on something you have. It could be a new generation of an existing product that uses different technology, that uses new ways of doing things, and it allows you to be clearly standing out in the market and being different from others. It could enlarge your market. It could rope in, attract additional new demographic groups, people who before were not attracted to your product or service and now are. It could give you the chance to relocate into markets where before you were not attractive for reasons of price feature being known, uh, not having a partner in a market, uh, being completely out of touch with the requirements of a foreign country, for instance, and you can fix that and now relocate into a new market. Uniqueness and novelty are not just features of a product. It could well be the way you deliver, the way you price, the way you interface with customers, the way you give a warranty, the way you engage, and the way you present yourself. The biggest challenge you have when you make a plan is that you try to create a perception, an image of the future. What you talk about is not yet reality. That means it doesn't exist. You can't just tell people this is what it will do because you know, because you don't know. It is something that you plan on doing. So what we do is we use current today's data. We then extrapolate. That means we take that data and we string it out in the future. 
we add growth factors to it, we add market growth, we add share numbers of how much we will take in a given market and what our market share will be, we end up creating a new future. But we base that on current facts. If you have a funeral home and you want to enlarge that by going into a different area, you look at how many people not died yesterday and the year before, but you estimate how many people will die in the next 10 years. What kind of people will die? What kind of religious groups? What ethnic groups? What kind of funerals do they need? You look at data that allows you to project how big the market will be, and then you interpret what your new product will do to get you a certain share, and suddenly we have a real number of expected services, expected product sales per year. Think about on this slide, you see a a depiction of what an experienced business coach does when they plan for a business. Talk about how you will get, and more importantly, how you will keep your customers. I see probably 20 presentations a year where someone proposes a new app. It's like a national sport. And the apps all sound great. They do something that is important and wonderful and exciting and sexy and money-making, and it's a great thing. But no one really factors in the true cost of marketing an app so that the world knows about it. An app is like a web page. It sits there. And if no one knows about it, no one uses it, there is no tribal effect where groups rush together to use your app, then you have no app. You have a sleeper app, and that doesn't make you money. So what we're after here is that you need to make sure that we keep a good eye first and foremost on the market, the customers, those that ultimately make us successful. We need a clear definition of what makes us better what makes us more exciting, what makes us more attractive than competition. You may argue that the competition is old, is weak, is not good. That's all fine. But right now, while you are planning, they're earning real money. They're expanding their brand. They're on the store shelves. They're on the web. They are doing things that you're just planning on doing, and so they're way ahead of you. And therefore, what they do is important to you. You need to show that even with them having an advantage of being in the market for much longer than you, currently earning hard cash, you can catch them, you can be successful. So think for a moment of what should be in this business planning document, the plan for your project, the plan for maybe a new firm, the plan for doing something different in a firm. We need to make sure that we don't give people too much detail up front because that turns people off. People want headlines. They want bullet points. They want excitement that jumps off the screen and bites them. They want to be engaged. They don't want to hear that you have all sorts of ISO number qualifications and that by the 19th of March of 2026, you will be in the city of Tabriz in Iraq. They don't care about that. They want to get a faster heartbeat early. They want to turn their cell phones off because they want to concentrate on you. They will tell the neighbor, stop talking. I want to listen. This is important stuff. So make sure that we have excitement that oozes off the screen, that oozes off the speaker, that hits people right in the head. Anyone with money, anyone who leads a company and has a manager like you come to them and ask for support, has seen those approaches many times before. And in every case, whoever presented what they presented did so with enthusiasm, with excitement. And the first thing that I look for when people come with exciting things is where they have blown completely beyond reason, where they have made arguments that clearly are not reasonable, that are overblown to the point of being just nuts. And when I see people who believe in nuts arguments, then I don't listen anymore because I know this project will never go. So inflating your opportunities beyond any sort of reason is a problem. That also means that you can't set yourself ambitious goals that you can never, ever reach. Tesla, 
a great example of a superb technology firm that believed you can overnight learn how to manufacture cars. And we have car companies who've been at it for a hundred years and they're still improving on how to build cars because they're not perfect yet. And here comes a company that sets ambitious goals to deliver cars that they have just made freshly manufactured new vehicles. And it's pretty clear that uh, you need to take a couple of zeros off their goal, then divide it by 10, then take half of it. And then whatever's left, maybe they get to. It is so self-destructive that you set goals that you then constantly miss and therefore you lose credibility. So what we ultimately have is we have something that has to be exciting, but within reason and supported by facts. And it has to look perfect. If you come to your manager with a proposal to do something different in your firm, if you come to investors with a proposal of funding something that is a new business, then we look at how careful have you been with your content and your presentation. And if you have typos everywhere, if this thing is hard to read, if you have clearly never practiced your pitch, then my thinking is, if this is how you treat an opportunity, then you probably are not gonna do very, very well in the market because you're careless, you don't put the right time in, and if you can't do some things right, you clearly haven't found people that can help you and do it right. So I'm not interested. So if we look at ultimately one of the big things that will probably come up in one of the projects that you might consider over the next couple of years, it is going global, especially for firms in New Zealand, because we're far away and small firms in China, because they're big and need exports firms in India who need in a developing country, huge foreign direct investment. And that comes from overseas. We go global. It is something that managers, that owners, that shareholders, that boards, that investors like, because when you go global, your chance is that you can attach a much bigger market immediately rather than a small market locally. And you're able to very quickly figure out what works, what doesn't work. And that drives your R and D and that ultimately creates opportunities. So think carefully about whether the project that you might be proposing is a project that allows you to argue for a global expansion. Maybe not right away, but maybe in phase two, in phase three, if there is a global dimension in your proposal, you will see that the interest peaks immediately. Every plan, every project that you propose requires governance. And governance we talked about before is the way we organize ourselves internally. It is the system by which some people are in charge and accountable. Some other people are given authority to get things done. We have a set of rules. We have a set of systems. You need to show that you understand that ultimately we need a person in charge. That person has certain rights and authorities is allowed to do something. That person then appoints other people. We have a limitation of authority usually, in many cases connected to spending money or hiring people or making major decisions. And then the ultimate question comes up of, if you're the person in charge, then who controls, who supervises you? Who do you report to? Who do you want to report to? Who do you think can help you if you run into trouble and you will run into trouble? There is no question that a plan is only the starting point and the moment you execute it, the world around you has suddenly changed and your plan will need changes. And where do you then go for a sounding board? Who do you talk to? So governance is important. The next big part that you must get right is that we identify the market. Is there a market and how do we know? If you ask three of your friends, would they like this product or service? And they say, absolutely, yes. Then that doesn't define a market. It only means that your friends were kind to you. So we need to go and we need to identify where there is a market. We need to get real numbers as to size, as to profitability, as to competitive richness, as to dynamics of R&D. Here in Korea, the national sport is inventing new electronic consumer goods. 
If you write the subway, which is deeper in Seoul than in most other places in the world for fear of attacks from the north, then you are well way down below and you can still in a fast network, in a fast moving train, on a fast handset, watch a complete movie in high definition DVD format, uninterrupted, no jerking, it is perfect. How do they do that? We can't do that in many countries above ground. How do they do that underground? How do they move so fast? And how are, how are they able to get electronics to go that get smaller and more competent every day and then sell at a better price? So we have some areas where we have clusters of expertise, where the market is different than what we're expecting. We must be able to take market information and to then transfer that into our plane and make actions out of that. If the market tells you something, then you follow that. You don't ignore that. So when you present a plan to your boss, when you present your plan for a product or a company to investors, if you tell me what your plan is, then you will get one question for sure. And that is, why has no one else done this before? Are you really the brightest person among seven and a half billion people to come up with this idea? Why has no one done this before? And if you tell me that you're indeed the brightest person among seven and a half billion people, I will walk away. That's silly. We need to define that maybe you have stumbled across something that allows you to integrate to make something better. Remember for a moment that when your parents bought their first suitcase, it didn't have wheels. When you buy a suitcase today, it will have wheels. In fact, it's pretty hard to find a suitcase today with no wheels. At the time your parents had bought their first suitcase with no wheels, the wheel had already been invented and was in use everywhere, on bicycles, on cars, on trucks, everywhere. So someone at some point decided that it would be a good idea to add a wheel, two, three, four, six, to a suitcase and never look back. So what we have is we have ideas that can be quite basic ideas where you would say, I'm not inventing anything new. I'm not inventing a wheel. I'm not inventing a suitcase. I am just combining existing resources in a cleverer way. That is a better answer. And then the investors, your bosses and I will want to know from you ultimately what will stand in your way. What barriers will there be? Are there restrictions on exporting your stuff? Are there restrictions on the materials you need to use? Is there a sole supplier that gives you the one item that you need and you depend on that? Do you need expertise in the firm that you don't yet have but need to accumulate? Those things all need to come together to be successful. So if we now look at the content, what a planning document for a project, for a new business, for a new division of a firm it would include it's usually the five c's it's capital the money it's capacity of what can we accomplish and what do we need for that it's the collateral what do we give as surety to the people who support us it's the character of people that make this project happen and ultimately it is the conditions under which we operate. So what we're after here is that we have a set that could change for different proposals for services and for products It's obviously different for a small local project. It's different than for a large global one. But this is a good starting point from which you can then extrapolate. When we look at capital, the money that's needed, a fascinating reality is that in about a 30% of plans that get sent to supporters, to bosses, to investors, the people who propose the business don't ask for any specific money. They essentially say, well, you know, you decide what you want to give me. That's utterly stupid. If you don't ask for money, you're guaranteed to not get the money you need. In a large number of other project proposals, you will find that the money that's being asked for is not enough. That means that the business is undercapitalized. It will die because it cannot achieve its objective 
with the money you asked for. And there is some sort of emotional hurdle that people say, oh God, if I ask for more than a million, then that's, that's too much. Maybe I should ask for only 500,000. Well, if that sounds a lot, maybe I should ask for 100,000. You need to ask for the money that you need to develop this project to the point that it no longer needs any money, but operates, stands on its own until it is cash flow positive, until it can pay its own bills. Up to that point, you can clearly calculate how much money you need. That is the money you request. And if you can't get that, you don't start. And it's a fascinating question when you ask people, how much money do you need? And they say 600,000. And you tell them, okay, I can give you 500,000. And they say, okay, I'll start. And you go like, well, if you needed 600,000 to get the job done, then 500,000 does not get the job done. So when you only get 500,000, but you need 600,000, you do not start. You either get the rest of the money or you return the money and say, sorry, we couldn't get enough supporters, can't get it done. I'll let you know in the future when things change and you give people the money back. You do not start burning up the cash, the support from your company or from third party investors on a project that you cannot complete because it is under capitalized. So capital is a big issue. It requires good thinking, what you will ultimately need to do. The capacity, what will this business be able to deliver? And when will it deliver that? We need to make sure that there is the ability to pay back to deliver value. That value could be in money. For most people it is, but think for a moment, could there be value in making a product differently so that it never breaks down? The reputation of lasting forever. We have a appliance brand in the US called Maytag and Maytag is built uh, like a Russian tank. When they make washers and dryers, these machines never break down. They last forever. They are inherited through generations. Is that something that would be a deliverable, a capacity that you develop? The nimbleness, the agility of constantly innovating, doubting yourself all the time and coming up with better ways to do things. Is that something that would be a value? Is it cash? Is it the recurrent cash, the annuity that you sell somebody a subscription? And that means that you know with some certainty what will be coming in as cash for the next month because most people that have a subscription keep a subscription. Would that be something that is a new capacity of the business? The most important part in any project is that you don't run out of cash so that you can continue to do what you have to do. And so cash flow is important collateral what will you give in return you are getting the chance from your boss you're getting the chance from shareholders to develop something new that could be a new job included for you as the general manager as the president of that new division when it kicks in and does well it could be great glory but what do those who trust you get in return and clearly they don't get the normal collateral, the surety that a bank would get when they take a mortgage out on your house. They get the title of your house. They own your house so that if you don't pay back your mortgage, they can sell the house and get their money back. It's not that collateral, is it? The collateral that most people give, especially younger emerging managers, is their enthusiasm, their commitment, their willingness to tarnish their CV to become burdened by a failure, if it is a failure, willing to make this work into a success. It is your life expectation of a clean, good CV that you bring to the party. Most people who emerge in management have an insatiable appetite to continue and go further. In order to do that, you need to put successes on the board, not failures. So you have a built-in desire, a fire burning in you that is probably brighter and hotter and more intense than for many other people. That is the collateral. That's what you're giving. In any project, 
once we have decided on what it is and you have explained what you'll do, the next big question is to the character of the people around you. Who will you get together that are completely competent, superbly able, and will help you pull this off? And if you can only find friends that are only coming on board because they're friends, not because they're good, then you have a problem. We want the best people. To win, you need A players. You need people who have done this before, who are expensive, who command a lot, but who can on their own make things happen that you would still have to learn. So we want to make sure that you have a good group of characters around your people where we can look at their background, where we can say they have done this before, they are good, and they probably will be successful. The last one is that I've never seen a deal. I've never seen something that comes across my desk for venture capital funding or for new things in a large firm that does not have some conditions, some special strings attached. Uh, it could be that one of your people that you need has a visa that expires in a year and then he or she will have to go back home. It could be that one of the key people in the team uh, has a sick grandmother and will have to return to Russia to take care of her. It could be that one of the people in the team only wants to work for two or three years and then retire to Fiji. We need to talk about what is there that makes this a possibility or that hinders its progress. And you openly talk about issues because once you bring them up, you bring them up with a solution that's a lot better than being asked about it later and then playing defense and not having a solution. So when you propose your plan, when you deliver this, it is very easy to be proud, to be strong, to be very convincing about your plan because you thought about that every waking moment for many, many months, could be more than a year or years. It is very easy to then overpower the audience and make them look like idiots because you know things so much better. Don't do that. Have respect for people who may not understand everything that you're talking about, but they have years and years of experience. Have respect for people who have money to give you as investors, because they clearly are needed by you, and they don't need you, but you need them. Have respect for those who have done this before in different ways and forms, and therefore can contribute thoughts and ideas that you might find critical but that in reality are constructive support. They try to help. And so when we have people who speak with a pride swelled chest, then sometimes that becomes a call to arms, a crusade. It becomes overwhelming and it turns off the audience. Your most important challenge with any plan for the future is that everybody knows that you don't know what the future brings. So we need to make sure that we develop a solid fact-based plank, something we can walk on into the future that has some numbers to it as to how much a market will grow, how profitable a market will be, ultimately what in a market will be important and what it is that you can bring to the party. It is important that we end up with something that tells the future in current terms. Can you get me excited about what will happen in three years from now? Because you have numbers, you have figures, you have people who tell me on a short 10 second video clip how much they want this product and they will buy it even if they have to wait for a couple of months for it to be produced. That is what tells me the future. When you walk people through your opportunity, one big thing is that they have not spent as much time as you have to understand the details. So when you use complicated long words, when you use technical language, when you use things, graphs, uh, descriptions, photos, that to you are pretty clear, but to an outsider look like a Picasso upside down and from the back, then that's not helpful. I always imagine that my audience is a group of eight-year-olds. They don't know long words. They have the attention span of a cricket. 
They are constantly with their minds on the hunt for other new exciting thoughts, and you have to make sure you keep them with you, you keep them focused. So that drives your presentation to the point of making sure that you have a group that constantly deals with you. The most important part when we start out to convince people is an executive summary, something that in 200 words and less tells the whole story. It is intended to give people a complete story so they don't have to look at the next 60 pages for all the detail. And if you get them excited enough to turn the page, you won. If they look at the executive summary and are not excited enough, they will not read the rest. So this is a page turning document. If they turn the page, you got a chance. If you didn't do a good job, they will no never go back that executive summary. You will not get a chance to present. So I will walk you real quickly through some of the sections, and I'm doing this somewhat fast because it isn't really important since every plan, every project will have its own set of sections, and you can very easily find business plans on the Internet that may have headlines that help you more than these here. This is a indication of what I have used before in some proposals, but it may not work for everyone. So you talk about what this project will do how it will be sustainable in the future. You talk about the people behind it, and those should be people much better than you, people who know incredibly rich information, experiences for many, many years of having done this. So this is not amateur hour, but this is a group of professionals. We look at the market. We determine with facts, numbers, figures, what the market is today, what the market will be in the future, and we look at the resources that we need in order to be successful with this project. Something that you do in a firm may not need much cash, but it may require a com company car for a couple of weeks to drive around, a couple of thousand dollars to fly somewhere to a conference. Maybe two or three people second it to you for 10 hours a week to work on your project. It may not be cash. It may be goodwill, logistics, rearrangement of funds for you to be successful. We need an organization. We need this governance. We need somebody who can ultimately say, this is good, this is bad, who is in charge. We need to make sure that you have a structure under which people are accountable and deliver the value that you promised. And we need to have enough money for good marketing. Marketing is expensive. Amazon is not for nothing a very wealthy company. Google it's doing very well. Adobe does very well. They provide access to markets and they charge for that. You get superb access to customers, tailored, targeted, in exactly the right postal code in any country that you want. But for that, you pay. And we need to make sure that you have budgeted enough for that payment. And then in every project, there should be at least a rough draft of financials. What will this cost? How much will I get back? How long will it take? And then you have a number of detail sections that go, of course, through your project headlines. And those are the ones that you would alter if they don't fit and make them fit specifically for you. So the important part is at the end, then, that you manage questions well, that when people ask you, you have a competent answer. There should not be a question you have not envisioned if you have practiced your presentation well. And therefore, every project plan, regardless how comfortable you are with English or whatever language you present in, regardless how comfortable you are with public speaking, when you get asked a question, you should have an answer. And I notice quite a bit, especially with international young leaders that emerge and will take big roles in companies, that they seem to be forced to answer even if they don't have an answer. There comes this completely different answer to a completely different question because they can't answer the question that you asked. And I have great respect for somebody who will tell me, look, I haven't looked at this angle. I don't have an answer for that. I will get it to you quickly. And uh, this is just something we hadn't focused on. We'll do that better next time. What's the next question? And then heads off a disaster because if you respond with something different, every questioner will know that either you didn't understand the question, you didn't want to understand the question, or you understood the question and think that maybe I forgot my question and you give me something back that's totally different. It is not a good setting. 
clearly, if you put this down on paper, this has to be formatted, presented properly. This is not the time where you have errors. And that means that you want nothing in a presentation that distracts from, detracts from the content. You don't want typos. You don't want too small type. You don't want colors that run into each other. You want someone to have a good look at this before you send it out and make sure it's perfect. Your presentation should be enthusiastic, but you're not converting people to a new religion. You are explaining something. You do it in terms that are clear, that are exciting, that make people want to deal with you more. But if for whatever reason this doesn't tickle them, this is not exciting, you're not going to beat them to death over what you think is right and what they should think in your opinion. The things that go wrong most often is that when you have more than one person presenting, that they aren't well coordinated. They effectively contradict each other sometimes, or they repeat a lot what the other person did. Practice is the key issue here. You need to practice. You need to video yourself when you practice. You need to then look at that video. You need to be critical. You need to bring in friends or people that you know or relatives and let them look at what you've done because they may have a different view than you have, and it could well be that their view is right. You sometimes have one presenter that knows everything and does everything, and the others kind of stand around. That concerns me as a manager or as an investor. What if there is only one person that understands what we're going to do, and what if that person falls off a roof? What if that person gets hit by a fish truck and gets eaten by the white shark off Papamoa? What will happen when you have that one person no longer able to contribute? And that scares me because then we have to probably set back that project quite a bit, and that's expensive. So the failures that we ultimately have in these kinds of settings is that we're not specific enough, we are not clear enough on the opportunity, we have a unrealistic expectation of what marketing is needed, we have no real way to be unique, maybe something that can be patented, something that makes us special long term. The financials don't hang together, and ultimately, this is all about excitement, but not about verifiable, fact-based illusion in the future that gives us the feeling that you have really thought through what to do. It is perfectly okay to not get your presentation perfectly right. But it is important that you show the people you present to, your boss for a new way of doing things, the shareholders for a major way of changing the company, investors for a complete new business proposal, that you have all the key answers. They may draw different conclusions than you, but you have made a fact-based, exciting, new project happen service, product, change of delivery, something that makes this company more successful, something that sets you free by creating your own business. And that is why we plan to make sure that all of those factors come together well. Try that on a smaller idea, something that may work, may work for you personally. Try that on something that may change the way you operate yourself. You are a business. You have resources. You have stakeholders, you have a plan, you have ambitions, you want to do something in the future, maybe you could plan on a change of what you do. Good luck.